Good afternoon and welcome to the HDI V Chapter meeting for this month. So pleased to have you aboard. It's a special treat today, observing National Cybersecurity Month. Just go over a few housekeeping details up front. You can get connected with people in the lounge, in the theater, and you can see who's here. You can check in at hdiconnect.com for blogs, for message boards, for Ask Your Network, and for the HDI Buyer's Guide. And remember that we have LinkedIn groups. The two largest groups are the HDI Professional Association Group and the HDI Desktop Support Professional Discussion Group, both available in LinkedIn. The Professional Association Group has about 8,000 members now, and the Desktop Support Professional Group has about 3,000. So go over and start a conversation, ask a question, and network with your peers. For today's environment, let's just get a little bit familiar with it, if we can. If you look at the top of your screen, you see the white menu bar. If you need help, there's a Help tab there. The folks at Expo are happy to jump in and solve your technical problems for you. If you have a question for the presenters, you can ask that question at the bottom of the presentation window. There, there's an Ask a Question box. Just type in and click Submit, and the question will come in. And we'll vet the questions and make sure that they're on point or get you some help uh, another way. Whatever we need to do for you, we will do. If you are tweeting today, by the way, the hashtag is ThinkHDI. So the agenda for today is uh, we're going to have a little HCI V chapter business, and then we're going to hear from um, our sponsor, LogMeIn, and then our guest speaker, Wynn Schwartzaw. And he's going to be talking about the best practices, and then uh, post-meeting collaboration and networking. So everybody will wind up back in the group chat at the end of the webcast. And we certainly want to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, LogMeIn, and more about that shortly. So here's a little bit about what's new at HDI. There's a new updated Support Center self-assessment, which is a great tool if you're interested in uh, benchmarking yourself against the HDI Support Center standard just to get an idea of where you stand and track your progression as you learn more and do more. Uh, please take advantage of the HDI self-assessment, which is available at thinkhdi.com slash services. And also, another reminder that HDI now offers a corporate membership. So if you've got 25 or more people in your support center, you could be eligible for a, a corporate membership, which has some financial advantages for you and will get you uh, the best package that you want to have for your organization's memberships. So check that out. Here's some new content from HDI to share this month. A September-October issue of Support World is available in the HDI Reading Room app and online. So head over to the Think HDI website and check out Support World if you have an iPad or uh, most um, most pa uh, tablets. You can get the HDI Reading Room app, and you can look at Support World right on your tablet. It's pretty cool. And then there's a new white paper available. Every business is a mobile business. It's about the widespread mobility that's happening in every business now, not just tech businesses and not just people with sales forces, just about everywhere. Some interesting statistics, which you can quote if you can grab those. Uh, average handle time is 8 to 10 minutes for incidents, 5 to 8 minutes for requests. And we do tweet those HDI stat today. We tweet that hashtag out. Um, and you can follow either HDI Analyst, which is me, or HDI Research, which is Jenny Rains. Uh, and you can get those stats. We tweet them out fairly frequently from our research. Check out the blogs on HDI Connect. There's anyone up there uh, between service management and resolution where you're losing time. And there's also a new HDI research brief 
on improving efficiency of customer service in higher education. And if you go under the research link on thinkhci.com, you'll find those reports. And then next month, we'll be hearing from Rick Mims, who is a, a long-standing HDI faculty member. He's not a member of the faculty anymore, but he's a, certainly an expert in service delivery. And he's going to be talking about that very subject in November right here in the webcast theater. So check that out. Cindy, are you back? I guess not. OK. So I'll move on. Just to remind you that. I am back. Oh, great. There you are. So just getting to talk about Fusion and the HDI conference. So it's all yours. Super. Thank you, Roy. For Sorry about the little glitch there. Um, again, we have a couple of very exciting events coming up. Um, starting next week, next week, coming right up, Fusion 14 in uh, the Gaylord National at Washington, D.C. And uh, it's not certainly not too early to start planning for the HDI conference next year in March of 2015 in Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Both should be exciting events. And our next item on the agenda is our HDI V Chapter website. Um, there's the URL. Um, we have all our upcoming events there, you know, what they are, as well as registration links. And um, all about the HCIV chapter is also on that site. So be sure to check it out, maybe even bookmark it. Um, we are very excited to announce that the HCIV chapter has a new VP of membership. We just held the election this past week. And Mark Fitzgerald will be our new VP of membership. Um, he is wonderfully qualified, has a great passion for this, has been involved with HDI heavily, and we're very excited and lucky to have Mark aboard. Um, we couldn't be any more pleased. So welcome, Mark, and I look forward to working with you. Um, if you have any questions during today's event, um, below there is an Ask a Question. We will be monitoring those and we'll ask them at the appropriate time. And um, you know, if we need an answer right away, we'll also be able to do that with HDI staff and B Chapter board members ready for your questions. So today we have a presentation from Log Me In, um, and the gentleman is Don Brass, who is the Senior Product Manager for Log Me In Rescue, and he has some information to present to us. Um, go ahead, Don. Thank you, Cindy. I just um, have, a, have a few slides here, nothing, nothing too in, uh, in depth. Uh, I know you're all here to see Wynn and uh, to hear Wynn speak. So um, I just want to introduce the company give you a little bit of an overview of who we are and uh, why we're interested in, in, in um, you know, speaking with, with you as an audience. So um, it, just, just a quick overview for those of you who aren't familiar with LogMeIn. We're, we're a publicly traded company. Uh, we've had uh, impressive growth uh, over the last uh, several years, and, um, and we really have taken that, that, that growth and, and invested that back into our products. So you're going to see very forward-thinking, uh, forward-leaning leadership in spaces like the Internet of Things and the support of things, uh, which, is, which is coming uh, very, very soon to, to our world. So um, uh, anyone who's interested in, in connecting on, on that kind of topic, we're, we're more than, than happy to engage with you. Um, we have quite a, quite a large number of users. Uh, I think we're actually up to about 60 million uh, active users currently uh, as a company and uh, half a million paying customers. And we have offices all over the world, right? So headquarters is in the U.S. in Boston, um, and the large amount of our, our development is over in Budapest, Hungary, where the, the company was founded. And, um, uh, but the office, uh, sales offices spread out throughout the world. So uh, the way we break up our products, the way we sort of look at our, our, our product offering is um, through four different clouds. Okay? So as you can see here, we have an uh, engagement cloud, a collaboration cloud, a connected object cloud, and, and an IT management cloud. All right, so, so some of this stuff is, is very relevant to, to what many of you do. Um, I'm, what I'm actually going to do is focus more on um, that first cloud there, the customer engagement cloud. Uh, really, it's, it's um, you know, what, uh, what drives support and engagement. 
right? Direct engagement with your customers and, and your employees directly, um, you know, directly through our products. So. Um, <clears throat> LogMeIn has several different goals, um, and um, really, you know, those are connecting people to machines, machine to machines, but most importantly, is still people to people. Okay, and and um, I'll share a little bit about about um, you know how we do that uh, in, in my next couple slides. So we're very focused on the professional help desk. Um, I, I mentioned uh, you know two of our products, Re Rescue and Bold. Um, Rescue and Bold uh, offer uh, so Rescue offers um, you know deep, deep technical support functionality, remote access, remote support functionality um, from your help desk. Bold Chat offers live chat as well as as email management and other social ways of engaging with your customers. Um, but when we talk about the professional help desk, we're really looking at companies and organizations who are dedicated and focused to giving support, to giving service and support um, to their either employees or their end users. Um, so. Uh, you'll find that our tools are able to uh, to do that on, on qu quite a high level, and, and as the topic of, of today's um, presentation, focused on security, uh, as a company, we've really spent a lot of time thinking about what security means these days, especially around the cloud. Right. So uh, when you look at uh, security at log me in we take it very seriously uh, we understand that a, a few years ago there was there were there were broad fears in the industry about using the cloud and, and, and what the imp security implications of that meant uh, and what we've seen recently is that's changed right so uh, what's happened is uh, you know the market has sort of moved beyond that sort of general fear of the cloud as a whole and now it's about it's not just about trusting the cloud or not just about trusting cloud products but it's actually about making the cloud work for you right so what and the way to do that is to, to work with companies that you trust. Um, so it's not just a, a broad, broad idea of, hey, the cloud is now safe because we're a few years into this now. No, it's, it's really it's working with the companies that you trust who are transparent in a way that you can understand what they're doing for security and that you can feel good about that. Uh, and that's something that we've really dedicated ourselves to. Uh, the key for us is, is, is really deliver, being able to deliver great products that are, that are known for being scalable, reliable, and easy to use without sacrificing security. Uh, and that's not easy. That's a challenge, right? So um, for, for the rescue product, the remote support product, <clears throat> we look at security through a few different lenses. We look at it through the administrator, right, who offers very granular permissions, can report on everything that's done in the tool, and can also actually even record live sessions to be able to audit and monitor what their technicians are doing. Uh, we also look at that technician or that support agent, and we give them different ways of logging in securely using things like SSO, IP restrictions, and, and others, uh, in order to make sure the person who logs in uh, is the right person to be giving the support. And then ultimately, we look at that end user, and we say, okay, how can we how can we protect this end user and give them the, the protection that they feel good about? Um, and by the, the main way we do that is making everything permission based in our tool, uh, and giving them the granular ability to pause or end a session at any time based on their comfort level. So we, these are just a few highlights of of, of what we do. Uh, we have some some architectural white papers written um, that can be looked at, and and certainly we're happy to to do a deeper dive on security at uh, at Log Me In and, and Rescue specifically. Um, Finally, the, the way that um, Rescue sits within a support organization or service organization is quite unique. Um, you know, ma many different organizations uh, run a whole variety of, of metrics, right? So you're looking at operational metrics and you're looking at experiential metrics. And what's unique about Rescue is that it can positively influence both sides of that story. Okay, it can positively influence the handle time and call resolution, right? Um, as you're dealing with, you know, and really drive savings from that front. But from an experiential side, we've had ex uh, incredible amount of success driving CSAT and NPS and, and, and other experiential type of measurements um, that you know that look at how happy that customer is and how likely they are to promote your organization uh, at the end of that support session. So, you know, these are the things that we focus on. There's some, some statistics there, some numbers there that um, from case studies we've conducted. Uh, and we have, of course, a, you know, a lot more information available for anyone who's interested. So uh, at this point, um, I'm going to actually pass the mic back to Cindy. And, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll transition into Win, And um, I, I will stay around. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And we'll make sure to get to those before the uh, session is done. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Don. Again, that's Don from Log Me In, who is the sponsor of today's event. And we shall move on to our next topic, which is our guest speaker, Wynne Schwartow. Wynne is one of the world's top experts on security, privacy, info war, and cyber terrorism. He is the author of more than 12 books on security and the recipient of a host of industry accolades. Wynn likes to get his hands dirty, so to speak, often getting directly involved with many of his clients' projects. He writes much of the content for his e-learning modules, videos, and monthly newsletters, all the while traveling the world and sharing his decades of knowledge at conferences. So um, I'll be happy to hand the mic over, and we're very excited and lucky to have Wynn Schwartow here today. Wynn? Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, all I am really is a security guy. And I've been involved in information security in one form or another now for a little over 31 years, assuming my map is correct. And I've been involved in the information warfare field, wrote a bunch of books. They're free, so please feel free to go out and download some, have a ball. And my passion has really been, been about security awareness, and whether it has been from the DOD standpoint, the financial sector standpoint, private sector, and especially uh, with family and kids, and there's another book I've got out there, which are, again is free, uh, so the Internet and Computer and Security Ethics for Kids and Families and Schools, which uh, is where we're seeing so many of the problems today that are occurring that are manifesting themselves inside the security problems that we experience inside of all of enterprises, and indeed, uh, a lot of what we're seeing in the cloud these days. But all of this came, and a lot of my opinions came, uh, because of a really fairly simple thing. Uh, I survived rock and roll. Uh, I grew up uh, as an analog engineer. And why this is going to matter to you is because I'm hoping to get you to understand that with the world of information security today, especially in uh, the enterprise, the help desk has some opportunities, has some capabilities, has some built-in features, including some of the stuff that uh, uh, Let Me In was talking about, which can severely become an asset to the entire security of an organization, regardless of the kind of business that it's in, assuming, of course, that the organization's upper management board, et cetera, uh, care about security, and hopefully they do in days like today. So in my background, I grew up an analog engineer, which meant that we didn't have digital. We didn't have all this stuff that you see here. And uh, my mother was an analog engineer at NBC during the war. My father was a, an engineer analog. He taught me a great deal of what I knew. So I grew up with these concepts of systems and things, and I started messing around with electronics as a little kid, and that was in the mid-50s. You have a handle as to how old I am at this point. And a few of you may remember, this is when we had to fix stuff. This is what we did. We went down there and pieced things together. And one of the words that you're going to hear me say repeatedly is the concept of manual intervention, getting your hands dirty in order to make things work when it comes to the world of security. Uh, computers, we didn't really know much about them, but I got a hold of one of these as a kid and built my first one. It semi-sort of kind of worked. And then in high school, uh, that's not me, but that is uh, our high school. And that was what we were doing back in the 60s was learning how to mess with this stuff. And then I ended up in the record business. Uh, my father was in it. My mother was in it. And again, all analog engineering. But one of the things that we're also going to be talking about is an issue of complexity. And the first real complex systems I got involved with was working with uh, Jimi Hendrix and Robert Moog with the early synthesizers. So today you push a couple buttons on a key on your keyboard and you get any sound you want. That device on the right, we had to individually program and have all the wires strung hither and yon in order to get the kinds of sounds that we were looking for that are today ridiculously easy to achieve. Again, this was manual operations of what today are exceedingly simple to the user but exceedingly complex on the back end. Then we had our own recording studios, and it was a lot of fun back in those days. But in order for me to learn anything, and in my opinion for any engineering discipline and any enterprise to really learn anything about 
what their responsibilities are and how to get from point A to point Z. They need to do something that we're terrified of, and that's learn how to fail. And every kid is not a winner. Every person is not a winner. We are humans. We're on a scale. But during my day as an analog engineer, the epic fails is where I learned more than anything about how to deal with ultimately what became security incidents, the kinds of things that we see in the news today. Is Russia going to declare cyber war on the U.S.? How do we defend ourselves against Chinese attacks? Financial services problems, the fraud, the fat fingering, all of these things that we're seeing today, I relate back to a few incidents uh, that hopefully will help you resonate and then understand how to make a transition as I point out some of the things that the help desk can actually do with this kind of slightly different mindset. So I'm going to take you back now to uh, mid-1970s, and we were doing a concert down in Jamaica during the political chaos days there, and it was Stevie Wonder, Bob Marley, and I was the assistant producer, and we're putting together this great concert. There's 100,000 people coming into the stadium. It's a great national event. Uh, Bill Cosby, Arthur Ashe, it's this huge, huge thing. So we've got the audio going. We've got the lights going. We didn't have video in those days to really do other than uh, an old uh, analog Kodak camera, uh, a couple of these photos from, from that era. So the concert is going along magnificently. We've got good sound. We've got good lights. The crowd, all 100,000 of them are grooving. And suddenly, all audio, all lights go off completely dark. Now, the British government was largely in control at that time in Jamaica, and they had warned us ahead of time, you really should prepare with riot cages in the stage. And we were going, riot cages? What? This is a concert we're doing. That's all. At that point, we understood because the crowd got very, very quickly exceedingly upset. 100,000 people, we got Stevie Wonder, Bob Marley on stage, no light, no sound. What do you do? And this is where we had to go completely manual. One of the roadies with us noticed that there was a little puff of smoke coming from a transformer, one of those boxes over near one of the power poles. And what had happened is we had, from all the lights, from all of the sound, and in a very old Jamaican country uh, infrastructure, we had overloaded the entire system. So the roadie, couldn't have been more than 18, 19 years old, he says, I got this. I know what to do. And he grabbed a couple canisters of CO2, went over to the pole transformer, it cooled down in a matter of 15 or 20 seconds. The light started coming on, the sound started coming back, and he gets arrested for, in those days, what is called terrorism. Well, we finally got it straightened out with that, but the concert went on. We finally got him out of jail and got the police to guard it. But that was a case of incident response, which strongly parallels many of the things that we go through today. Another case occurred with a TV show many of you know, may know. It's called Liza with a Z. We were doing Liza Minnelli, and it was a great album. She had a Broadway show, and they wanted to do this phenomenal live event that had never been done before. This was a combination of audio and video. And back in the early 70s, this was exceedingly hard to do. We didn't have real technology. We had to kind of kludge it all together. And what happened? The synchronization, and we hear that term a lot today when we sync databases and sync contacts, the synchronization between the video and the audio completely failed on an hour TV show. What do you do when you have two days to go live on NBC. Again, an epic fail situation, an incident response. What do we have to do? We have to go manual. And we actually had to sit there with this equipment and using a knob, a conventional old rotary knob, we had to keep the pattern on the oscilloscope looking like that for an hour, which is impossible to do. So we did it in 473 separate chunks of four bars of music and glued it all back together again and finally made the show. Again, we had an incident, an analog one, 
automation did not work, technology did not work, and we had to go manual. And the same thing happened later on with early synchronization with Rod Stewart, John Lennon. We lived through all of these types of events. So in order to take some lessons from this into the world that we live in, I, I really started looking at what I learned back in those days and how it applied to security. And you've probably heard this before, but in our world in security, so much of what goes wrong, it's really not the technology, it's the human. And whether it is the human pushing the wrong button, it is the human being nasty and not operating according to for the goodness of the organization. This is what causes the predominance of security events. And you've heard the term social engineering, where the bad guys are trying to connive you, either through telephones, through pretexting, phishing emails. There's all sorts of wonderful technologies for this. And what do we do in response? We throw more technology at it, which to most security people these days is another way of epic fail because we're adding complexification. We're adding more and more technology to solve something that is fundamentally a human problem. So a couple of the basic things that everybody that deals with any sort of security needs to really understand is at the end of the day, power is God. You lose power, it's all gone. We were just talking before this show, and I'm right now in the south. We've got huge storms coming through, and what happens if I lose Internet, if I lose power where I'm physically located? Okay, do we have a backup plan? How good is that backup plan? Same sorts of things that need to be addressed in the enterprise is that plan A is not always going to work, regardless of what you're doing, how technical it is or how human it is, you've got to have a plan B. Whatever plans you've got, whatever you're thinking about doing in any professional business environment, regardless of your industry, is to test it and to exercise it and make sure that when the IT does hit the fan, that you do have a path of some sort. And we'll get into some specifics here, some things that I've actually experienced. And when it hits the fan, you've got to break the rules. It's a matter of getting the concert back up. It's a matter of making that NBC deadline. It's a matter of getting your data center back online. It's a matter of making your customers happy. Same sort of thing that I experienced in another industry, in another era with different technology. It's the same fundamental issue we have today is keep your customer happy. But first... I'm going to tell you about a few things that I've actually experienced that really helped trigger not only this specific talk, but a lot of my view changes actually in the last 18 months uh, to see how bad things have actually gotten. And so when I'm going to be indicting uh, some specific cases, please don't think I'm just indicting this company because I hate them. I am customers of all of these companies, and in general, I am very happy with them. But because I come from a world of security awareness, I notice things. And when you notice things, part of the one rule in security is if you notice something, do something, say something. That is what security awareness is about. Uh, New Yorkers know real well, if you see a really suspicious package, do something about it. You see the wrong guy walking down the hallway of the office, do you challenge him and do a Bruce Willis tackle him? No, but you've got to let somebody know. By doing nothing, that declares immediate failure. So the first thing that happened that really started changing my mind uh, was with uh, Chase. We, uh, my wife and I had done a refi with some of these absurdly low rates on our home, went through the normal processes and the closing lady came out to the house, we signed the papers, and all was good. The following day, two days later on Sunday, Saturday, sorry, my apologies, I get uh, a physical mail with a credit card in it. It's from a bank that I actually happen to use, but it's a very small, tiny, regional bank that nobody's ever heard of, and I use it for my personal banking. And in it was, welcome to your new account, and here's your new credit card. And, well, no, I didn't do this. Something's fundamentally wrong here. And then 
my wife and I said, wait a minute, we just refied. What do you, how did this happen? Is this identity theft? And I said, well, I got to call Chase and find out. So I call the back of the number on Chase. And I say, hi, um, customer service. I've got uh, this problem that my credit card, and, and I think there may have been a security issue, and I don't know. Can you put me through to the right department? Oh, sorry, security is closed. What, what, what do you mean, security is closed? Oh, the security department only works from 9 to 5 on Monday. You'll have to call back in a couple of days. I said, wait a minute. What we're talking about here is potential identity theft. I'm using a key word that should mean something to a financial institution, help desk person, or it's a customer service person. Chase may have a data breach of some sort going on, maybe. I really need to talk to somebody. I spent the following three and a half hours calling every number I could find and I could get through in from the Chase website and the credit card statements, et cetera, trying to find and every one of the help desk and customer service centers said, sorry, there's nothing we can do found a security number, called that, please call back Monday. So at this point, it was 10.30 or 11 o'clock, and my wife said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to do the only thing left to do. I wrote it all up, you know, a few hundred words of what had happened, and I put it on my Facebook account and J.P. Morgan Chase's Facebook account. Eleven minutes later, a friend of mine who happens to be a vice president of security there, he calls me, he goes, Win, what the devil are you doing? And I said, I think it works the other way around. And what we had discovered was a complete epic fail inside the incident response system from the conventional customer service that did not talk to security. And the point was, when a customer who's not going to be as aggressive as I am, who's not going to be as aware as I am, just your casual customer, calls up and reaches a roadblock with the organization that is supposed to be the expert and supposed to have your best interest at heart. So there's nothing we can do till next week. What does that do to the customer? How much worse can the situation become? What does it do to in this case, Chase, it just, if it had been a real huge data breach instead of what it really was. They ended up going through some very, very expensive retraining in order to tie together the different help desks that had, had no communication between them. So while I got uh, everything fairly well solved, uh, Chase ended up being highly embarrassed by having no mechanism in place by which to have any sort of incident response from their help desk and customer service groups uh, that were public facing. Another one that happened, and I've been using American Express for uh, 30 some years, and I'm not yelling at them about this. However, I got a number of phone calls one night, and on the caller ID on my phone, it said American Express. And a lady would say, hi, th th this is a Sheila from American Express, and we're trying to validate there may be a problem. Can you confirm the following information? Immediately, as a security-aware guy, I go, wait a minute. American Express never calls, and no legitimate organization should ever call and ask for what is called PII, personally identifiable information, that can have security implications over my identity and the actual security operations within uh, an enterprise such as American Express. So I received two or three of these calls, and I said, okay, something's wrong. So I call back American Express, who normally has very, very good customer service, and I tried to explain to them that there was this perceived problem. Somebody is doing outgoing calls on their behalf, has spoofing a caller ID, hear all the phone numbers, attract the IP addresses. Again, I'm a geek, so I know how to do this stuff. But if I was just a regular old customer, hi, I've got this problem, what should I do? And when you get an answer from a company like American Express, don't worry about it, I have a problem with that as a response. I don't think that that is informative to the customer. In my case, I knew, I know the language, but average Dick and Jane, they're not going to know, don't worry about it, is not a comforting response when you suspect a security incident. Again, this epic fail was not as bad as the other, 
but the remediation, the comfort, the support that is supposed to come from a financial institution back to the customer, and in this case that's all I was, was a regular old customer, was not there, and I think that was a fail. Uh, same thing happened with um, somebody that works for me, uh, with LendingTree. Apparently she ended up on some list somewhere, and LendingTree and or their associates started bombarding her, and she was getting 40 to 80 phone calls a day. She tried to call LendingTree, finally got a hold of customer service, and customer service says, all right, well, we'll put that down. It'll take four to six weeks to update the database. Every single person on this call knows it doesn't take four to six weeks to update a database. It takes a little attention at your keyboard, done now, thank you, and batch processing will propagate that change either immediately or at midnight depending upon the nature of the installation. They do this because LendingTree and all of its associates don't have the back-end agreements to protect customer identity strong enough built in. So therefore, another epic fail from the standpoint of what the customer service and help desk, customer facing, public facing, it just did not work at all. The IRS does exactly the same thing. When there is an issue, and it happened to another one of my employee's sons, he went to, he was off in college, and somebody had stolen his identity, and it turns out that a little over 10% of every kid under the age of 18 in the United States has had or currently has his identity stolen by criminals because they're not going to notice until they're after 18. Same thing happened to poor little Michael and the IRS's response, you're going to have to come into an office for an interview. And since you filed taxes in Florida and you're in New York and it went through this again, epic, cumbersome fail that the customer service needs of the customer we're not at all met or addressed, and especially when we're dealing with a security incident. We've all heard about the Home Depot event, and what they did was awesome. I thought they did a great deal. They said, yes, oops, we don't know how it happened. We don't care, but we're going to fix it for the customer as fast as we possibly can. And there are remediations. They followed the law, and they gave everybody, and I was on that list as well, uh, for credit monitoring services. They took care of the customer immediately. And this is really, in my mind, what customer service and help desks are for, and how can they then apply this into uh, the world of, the, of security that I live in. So uh, applying the concepts of uh, all of this, what are the real two common elements? One, it's people just needing help. People, not technology, human beings, that may have noticed something or experienced something that would be called an incident, and in my case, incident in the security world. Number two, almost all of these companies typically fail, and they fail largely because, in my experiences of seeing this in large financial institutions and uh, government institutions, admission of anything that may be wrong would create potential legal culpability and we might get sued so it's best to admit nothing and they like the CYA mentality let's just ignore it for a while we'll keep it to ourselves and see how it all shakes out and in my mind this is absolutely epic fail and this is where some of the opportunity really really exists for help desks to become part of a solution versus part of the problem. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind that are, again, exceedingly simple. We're dealing with human beings here. We're not dealing with massive technology. What we're talking about is security awareness. I don't expect, nor do I want, and nor should any operations manager in any major organization want somebody at the help desk or customer service to become a security expert. There are a lot of security experts inside of an organ, a major organization. They should know which buttons to push. What you need is that person to be the comforting, the psychological, things will be all right, let me help you, let me connect you, I'm not going to hang up on you. And the simplest way to view it is how would you like to be treated? And when I get involved with these kind of things at Chase and other organizations that I deal with, and I throw that into management's face, that there's kind of a twinge. And the twinge is this bifurcation, this kind of schizophrenia that they've got, 
One is, yes, I as a customer would really like to be treated nicely, but I as the manager and fiduciary responsible agent for this organization knows that if I do what I'm supposed to do, we could end up in legal trouble. That is a problem that has to be addressed by culture. But the help desk can be a huge facilitator in bridging the consumer experience, whether it's an inside internal consumer or external consumer, and the security of the organization and the individual. One of the words that really, really, really bothers me is the word try. And Star Wars fans will know that Yoda says, no try, just do. When people say they're going to try to do something, they don't say they're going to do it. That means they're going to try and they might and maybe, but the word try does not mean succeed. And one of the things that is a psychological tool to be used when you're dealing with customers that are having potential security incidents that can affect their lives is you really want to convince them, support them that you're going to do something about it. You're going to do, I will find the security guy that can help you. I will stay on the line with you. I will, give me your phone number. I will call you back if we get disconnected. Not, I'll try. Huge difference there, and the psychological value of that word will notch up the customer's experience with your particular data center, help center, or customer service. The other component that we're going to be talking about is documenting and metrics. Security is very, very, very difficult to measure. How strong is your firewall? Oh, it's a three. It's a seven. Well, how are you documenting it? What are the metrics? Exceedingly difficult to do, and our industry cannot agree on how it all works or should work. However, I have seen and implemented metrics within help centers and customer service centers over the years that have measurably been able to increase the level of security in such a way of, within an organization that it is actually demonstrable from an ROI standpoint. It's not difficult to do. It's not building new infrastructure. I am sure that with some of the tools, even from Let Me In, they're going to provide a lot of this for documentation of events. Just because it's not a replacing an order or something got misshipped or you're trying to fix because it's a security incident does not mean that it does not belong at some central location that you already have an existing infrastructure. You already have an existing group of people who are trained to deal with customers. I think working from them, using that as an asset, is going to be of huge benefit. Some of the help incidences that you're going to hear if you get involved in this and become supporting is finding these sorts of things inside of major organizations. Uh, People surf in porn organizations. You have no idea what the numbers are. It exceeds 30% in certain metric studies right now. Uh, when you see stupid, stupid things, network doors wide open, back doors held open for smokers, common sense things that when you have a little bit of security awareness, people notice, and inside of an organization, if they have a good security program or a good security awareness program, one of the keys is, who are you going to call? And in a lot of places, uh, they've got uh, some email addresses and they've got, uh, give us a call on Monday, uh, it's no panic. I mean, you see this full spectrum of we really, really care to, like, who gives an IT? It doesn't really matter. But these are all real type of help incidents that occur and people are trying to get some help, and we need to treat it as such, and you as potentially the recipient, the first line of defense for those kind of calls. Uh, it, it's like with police uh, at a national incident. Any major national law enforcement incident begins with a phone call to the help desk at the local precinct, to the 911 number, to a dispatcher. The dispatching services that help centers and customer service centers have are perfectly attuned to helping with security incidents very, very quickly. Um, these are all, honest to God, real things with laptops exploding, uh, email servers going completely nuts. Does that mean that you need to be a security expert? No. You need to help bridge the person who noticed it, who's experiencing the security incident, 
to get them to a place or a person where something can be done. Absolutely real. I was involved in this one. There's another one I got involved in. Absolutely real. Now, this is something that took us a little bit. I was not an expert on this, but this is actually a bomb threat by a suicide bomber in front of a building in Washington, D.C. that handles an awful lot of money. And I noticed it going into the company, and I, I said something, and apparently the paint was still wet. It had only gone up a short time before. And this was a symbol for, here, we're coming to get you. They did what they had to do, but again, the reporting process, the incident was real. The incident needed a response, and there was a tactical response by the security group. You're not going to have a perfect script in the world of security at the help desk or customer service. It's all about the odd stuff, the, some of the things you never think would actually occur. We have found actually guys running porn servers for pay from inside of an organization. We found that management inside of IT was so bad they never remove the users who have not worked there perhaps for years. At a major financial institution in New York, we actually found a collusion of people who are hacking hospitals and banks in Europe from their servers in New York. Again, I don't expect the help desk to solve these problems. I hope that they can help facilitate the process to get to the right people who can actually do something. So what can you guys actually do? And it's about awareness. It's nothing really, really hard. And it's thinking about security in different ways than perhaps you've ever thought about security uh, in a much uh, more fluid, in a much more simplistic way than all the crazy kind of stuff I've been throwing at you. How can that all be made a lot easier? Well, simplicity. It's all about simplicity. Complexification of technology we know is a security problem, period. We know it's an identity problem, period. With privacy, safety, keeping things simple is an absolute requirement for technology, privacy, security, safety, and ultimately for how do you communicate in a field where you're not the technical expert with customers who are not the technical experts, how do you determine what's going on? The first thing you've got to do is think about people. People think in threes. Very, very simple. Triangles are the strongest natural structure. Thus, we have hexagons. We have geodesic domes in the physical world. We have crystalline shapes. If you look at snowflakes, they're all based upon the construct of threes. The body relates to threes. Our language does. Scripts, jokes, they all think about concepts of threes in order to resonate with us as human beings. And it's just called Rule of Threes. Take a look. And it's a fascinating study on how to get people to understand and relate to what you're talking about. So from a security standpoint and a security awareness standpoint, we use threes all the time because it works a lot easier to remember three than it is David Letterman's top ten. When you go back to the phone companies, initial use of phone numbers way back in the 1920s, it was three plus four for a reason. Their psychological studies had shown how memory works. But as soon as we go to 10, it was 3, 3, and 4. And that's part of the natural rhythm and cadence by which we experience life. So in the security world, we encourage this, to think this way. And hopefully, I'm going to be able to give you a tool that will be able to actually be useful to you if and when you get involved in the security incident response aspect of help desk and customer service. So the concept is that of the taxonomy, and that's just merely an organization of data. How do you think about things? And the security awareness taxonomy is going to do three things here. It's going to help you. It's going to help your customers. And ultimately, you've got to be able to measure all this stuff. And me doing metrics in threes is exceedingly simple. So I'm going to give you a first example of something that is really, really simple. In the world of security, we all talk about 
uh, make sure you use a really, really, really strong password. Well, the problem with that really, really, really strong password is going to be a string of meaningless digits. And we've seen those crypto codes flying down the screens and in movies and on TV. And I'll never remember all of those codes. And then i got to write them down. And if I write them down, then I'm breaking my security policy rules. How do I do it? How do I make sure that I do something about my password control alone? And again, a very simple concept based upon threes we call the SNL. Now, SNL, Saturday Night Live, they just celebrated their 40th anniversary. But SNL compi comprises the basics of how to construct a strong password. Symbols, numbers, and letters. Fundamentally simple. How do you combine them? That becomes an exercise in a little bit of creativity, which is the second level. But the fundamental highest level to get people to remember is something this simple is SNL. Saturday Night Live, symbols, numbers, letters, and then you can work from there. Again, when we do security training, when we do security awareness, and from a help desk standpoint and most of your users, they're not going to be security experts. You're there to help facilitate. That's all it's there for. Not for you to tell them how to do everything. Not for you to find out what wire is broken to make the facilitation of the potential security incident valuable. So when somebody calls up with a security incident, and again, you've got probably two not terribly technical people talking to each other, but they're real-world smart people. How do they communicate, and what are the basics? What are the ones that you really need to deal with? And the first ones you've got to figure out is what we call the security domains triad, again, a level of three. Is the problem that you're observing or experiencing, is it a physical one? Is it a door? Is it a box? What kind of physical issue is it? Is it a people problem? Did somebody fall, keel over, have a heart attack? Is the FedEx guy doing crazy things? Why is the UPS guy sitting at a computer? Is somebody walking around the office without a badge? Or is it cyber, where you've got a really, really screwy email, or your screen has all these characters, what domain are you dealing with? Question number one, because then that helps focus how you're going to take this individual to the next step. And the next step, again, is pretty simple. It's another triad, and we call it the lives triad, the many lives. Is this something that is affecting you professionally? Well, if you're at work and it's an internal call, sure, yeah. That would be a professional more than likely. If you have a mobile BYOD, bring your own device mobile program, it might be a little bit different. And that might fit into the mobile world a little bit. Again, this is a way of thinking about security at the highest levels. Or are you customer facing to the outside world and then it's a personal issue? Understanding how these triads tie together is absolutely the easiest and very, very critical way to observe and help document what you're trying to achieve. Once you've got these first two down, the third one that we use is called the classic security triad. What's the problem? And let's say it's a confidentiality problem. Does that mean the door is open so people can get in and you can't get your secrets and you can't keep the bad guys out? Okay, that would be physical, people, confidentiality. Uh, I can't get on the Internet. Okay, that's an available issue that would probably then come from the cyber world, and if it's a customer facing, it would be personal. So the personal customer can't get on your website. Availability, cyber, people. These three triads, when you glue them together, and you can use these charts, you can have these posters, you can, uh, I'll give them to everybody, no problem, because it's, it means that much to me that everybody understands. These three really, really will give you the basics for a reporting mechanism to help find out where to go for help. Because, for example, uh, in most companies, uh, you've got HR, all right, what kind of human problem do I have? you got, in some cases, physical security, the, the guys with guns and guards and dogs maybe. Or is it a pure cyber problem? And in each case, who you're going to contact and who you need to go for resolution is going to be slightly different. But this kind of matrix will really help. Uh, we use the same kind of triads when we're talking about phishing. 
online fishing. There's phone fishing, which is the pretexting, spear fishing, going after specific companies, whale fishing, going after specific people. Again, going into very, very easy to remember sets of threes. And when you glue it all together, you have a real simple chart. No, you know, th this is absolutely a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. And I I'm going to point it out because there, there was an issue here that occurred with the audio. And I don't know whether it was the storms. I have no idea. I didn't see anything occur until I was just notified. But what happened here was that the organizers, Don and uh, uh, Cindy and the others, pointed out to me in a side channel hey, we can't hear you. So they had a plan. There was a backup system already built into this to say, oh, when something went wrong, they didn't have to be technical. I didn't have to be technical. And they said, just please dial back in, which I did. But this is a perfect example of being prepared for a fail, which is what we just experienced. So thank you for letting me know on this. So again, Point, uh, where did you lose me when we were talking to the experts, uh, just so I know where I am? Right before that went. Okay. Uh, under the slide with the uh, little hairy guy down there, uh, this is making sure that you know under what cases what to do. Simple first-level triage. That's all that we're really talking about that the Help Desk and Customer Service Center needs to be in the case of a security, if they get involved in the security incident response. What do I do? The door's open. Who do I call? Somebody's walking down the hall. Who do I call? My computer's melting. Who do I call? And perhaps the help desk will have a set of first, second tier level questions. It's like, well, if your computer is acting this way, unplug it from the network. Simple, normal response. Uh, I see smoke coming out of the door. Get out of the building now. Good first level responses, but these need to be structured ahead of time so you have those first level responses, just like the fail that we just went through. How do you pull all this off internally? Advertise. If you decide to get involved in this and make the help desk or your customer service desk part of the security solution and security infrastructure, advertise it. Let people know. In all too many organizations that I'm involved with, people go, well, if I see something wrong, what do I do? Who do I call? And then they pull out the internal phone book. They start scratching their heads because there's no major advertising program to build into their brain what to do. Oh, wait a minute. I remember the sign that I saw down by the men's room. Maybe I should go down there and see what I should do. Advertise it and make it simple. Get an internal 911 number. And now with VOIP circuits, building in a special 911 circuit that will go to the right place, and perhaps it's to your help center, perhaps it's someplace else, is a lot better than trying to give people 22 digits so they can do it from anywhere. Now, if they're not on premises or if the customers are external, then you're going to need to do as simple as 800 911 some numbers that will make sense, perhaps putting them into digits. There are plenty of ways of doing this. Or they call the regular number, and one of the numbers is, if you're having real security issues with us, hit 911 for an internal rerouting. Again, unless your customers, internal or external, know that you're offering this and it is part and parcel of the security effort for them, individually and for you as the organization, you're not going to get buy-in because they don't know. Next thing that you've got to do is make sure you can communicate with the caller. Communicate accurately. Uh, that's one of the reasons we like using infographics these days, isn't it? Because it's so much easier to communicate infographics than it is with 5,000 words. And it's real typical simple triage. Who, what, when, where, and how. Give us all the information in this little bit according to the matrix I showed you in the various domains and the various lives. Suddenly you have a huge amount of data. The other thing that's exceedingly important is when you're talking to the customer, acknowledge that, yes, there's a problem. Yes, you perceive a problem. Whether you think it's BS or not doesn't matter. They think it's real. They're experiencing something, and unless part of your job function is to do all the examination and really find out what's really, really wrong, 
Your job is to get them put to the right place. And that means escalation. Escalation means that you have to have your organization pre-planning as to what to do. In many of the organizations that I've dealt with, which DOD and finance, it's if the IT hits the fan, what do we do? I, uh, for 9-11, the stock exchange, one of our clients, what did they do? They chose immediately. We're escalating, shutting down, that's it. How did the stock exchange get back up in four days? Got back because they had 500 people holding the wires under police guard in order to rebuild confidence. They had an escalation procedure that in that case as well went back to a manual override of every system known to man. Instead of trusting the fiber optics running under the street, they went for a complete manual override. And they explained it clearly to the public. It was very, very well managed from a PR and customer perception standpoint. We're down. We're going to fix it. Give us a few days. Chill out. The country's in trouble. Then you see 500 guys holding wires 24-7, and suddenly you get it. You understand it. Other thing to keep absolutely in mind without being a security expert is everything I'm telling you is time-based. In the world of security, if there's an incident, the longer you wait, the more damage that's going to occur, which goes back to making the process well-defined, understanding enough about the customer to be able to channel him to the right place as quickly as you possibly can. Respecting your customer is absolutely critical. Even though you know for an absolute fact it's his or her fault, Unless you are specifically authorized to do that, stay away from that. Let the experts deal with that. You hit the wrong key. Did you plug it in? All of the things that might be really simple and dumb. Respect your customer because the next time, maybe he won't be so inclined to call back, especially if it's an internal issue, if you disrespect him. And from your external customer standpoint, respect him because you don't want to lose your customer. You don't want to lose them. So respecting them is part of this communication process that's absolutely required to get through the process. Document it uh, in your system, whether it's Let Me In or some other uh, uh, system that you're using that's at the keyboard. Take some of these ideas, perhaps, and build an electronic form that will make it easy. Make it easy to document where the call's from and all the normal kind of stuff you would do to repair a customer a service order error or something. Create it. Use the matrix. Determine severity. Escalate it. Document it. Now, here's the reason why, because organizations often spend a boatload of money on security. Yet they find it often very, very difficult to say, well, how well was that money spent? When you do security, security awareness, and security incidents, you can actually document from a ground base of where you are now, which is probably close to zero. Most places are until they get involved in this. You can look at the delta and notice increases and trending of events and awareness through the organization. The other thing that you can notice is the potential when an APT, an advanced persistent threat, which is still the most common type of enterprise attack from nation states and organized crime, comes at your organization. Your users and their reporting and the documentation that's created may notice an APT or other security incident that's much more important before anybody else does. Just like crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and all of the ubiquity of things that we see on the Internet with trending capabilities, the same thing exists when you apply and utilize something like this within your organization. Weighing it is absolutely critical, and this is all part of what happens with this collected data. What is it worth? Well, if over a period of a year you get three calls, well, and maybe it was worthless or your security is super, super high, there's some potential uh, answers depending upon the nature of the culture in the enterprise. But weigh it. Unless you examine it, you don't know, and you're going to hopefully have a fair amount of data. I can tell you, uh, that in one financial institution, which was reasonably small, uh, 2,200 people, not very big, but once this system was put into place, within six months, security incident reporting went up over 
which made management, well, both happy and unhappy. The unhappy part was, wow, there's some things going wrong. But the happy part is at least now we know about it. And as a public company, there are responsibilities for knowing about risks under Sarbox-Oxley uh, laws. There's reporting obligations for GLBA, for various types of customer interactions where there's a chance of identity theft. So weighing this data and measuring it over a period of time, absolutely critical. When you decide to have an escalation procedure, uh, I have seen it all too often. Let's call the police. Let's get the FBI in. That is the last thing in the world you want because their often knuckle-dragging first response is to confiscate all the computers so we can figure out what it is. Well, then you're out of business. Internally, getting involved with a compliance officer, HR, internal counsel, external counsel, a security incident response team called a CERT. These are all very common types of organizations and escalation procedures that are very, very well documented on how to pull off that the help center and customer service centers can trigger into and create that escalation procedure, then get about back to their day-to-day -day job. Again, it's about triage. Change it. At the end of the day, change it, because whatever you design today is going to work, maybe. Maybe it won't. But the iterative process, that feedback process of establishing a process and not putting it so far into concrete that you cannot change it is the flexibility and some of the wonder of the technology that we have today. Make sure that if you take this kind of approach, that you're willing to, oh, that didn't work, and we can see it didn't work, and, and sorry, Bob, that was your idea, but now we've got to change it over to Gary's idea. His is better. Update it, monitor it, iterate, be, iterate it, because we have the capability to look at our processes and change them very, very quickly. Absolutely critical, and part of the message that has to go throughout your internal staff, and hopefully some, depending upon the business you're in, to your external customer, is ask questions. If you're not sure, ask. It's no such thing as a dumb question. Use common sense. These are the two biggest things that we try to teach in security awareness. Use common sense and don't try to be the expert. You're an expert at something else. You're not a security expert. There's not a whole lot of us that are around. And if you never change anything, nothing is ever going to change. So hopefully some of these ideas and thoughts can give you a platform by which to consider how to, if you choose, integrating your existing help desk customer service centers and let them be part and parcel of how to make your internal security and first levels of defense stronger than they ever have been before. And I apologize for the glitch, but it actually served as a real world example. And I would be very happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wynn. Uh, that, was, that was a great presentation with lots of relatable examples. Um, I have a question here. It's, it's the one of the things that support centers often struggle with is password resets. How much information should the help desk verify and how before resetting someone's password? Ah, uh, that's an excellent question. The organization should have some sort of identification mechanism as part of policy. And it can become very, very difficult. Typically, rule of thumb, email, no. Uh, by telephone, you then have an additional challenge. Do you actually know the person? Uh, do you not know the person? Under the assumption that you don't, which is typical, what is the validation? What is your employee name? What is your employee number? Okay, those can be stolen and hacked fairly easily. The recommendation is when your organization has sets up its AD, and that's Active Directory, or user accounts, there should be some unique identifier for that particular individual that would not be part and parcel of a normal database that can be breached. And it could be, uh, are you at the phone number we have on file? Uh, no, I'm not at my mother's house. Well, when you get to the phone number on file, we can call you back. 
and that's called two-factor authentication in one case. It's called out-of-band communication in another. In many cases, this occurs right now, when, uh, depending upon how you have your mobile banking set up, for example. Hey, I want to uh, move money from this account to this account. Well, we're going to send you a text that's your phone number on file to verify your identity prior to allowing you to take this particular action. So there are mechanisms that exist, and you have to be careful, but it should be absolutely policy-driven by the CIO chief information officer or chief information security officer. Thank you. Um, another question here is, you had mentioned some free books and and other papers and matrixes. Where would people be able to get that information from? All right. If the matrix and the posters and everything that are on here, um, how you guys want to make it available, uh, that's up to you guys. I'm happy to send it to you for you to distribute um, your call. That would be great. We could put it available for download in the download section. That's that absolutely right? fine. And when it comes to the books, uh, that's the log me in, guys, and I don't have that answer at all. Okay. Okay, another question here um, from a supervisor of a service desk um, in a company that has other opportunities outside the service desk. Um, if one of the service desk analysts expressed an interest in beginning to cybersecurity, um, are there certifications you would suggest they get, such as Network Plus or Security Plus? Um, boy, it, it depends where they want to go. There are so many different areas in the world of cybersecurity. Uh, first, you know, I, a, somebody, a geek, would have to determine what do they know now? Because going into the C++, the CN, CNAs, and all of those, those can be exceedingly complex and depending upon whether you want to sit at a firewall for the rest of your life or not. Or if you want to be more of a generalist, uh, I would initially talk to, uh, look at CISSPs uh, through ISC squared or go to the EC Council and look at some of their training for uh, ethical hacking but without knowing more of the technical background of the particular person, it's difficult to say exactly where to start. Uh, SANS Institute tends to be very, very technical, but highly, highly good. ISC Square to be in the middle, and I think the uh, EC Council will give you more of a broad spectrum from basics up to super sophisticated. Great. Sounds like there's lots of ways to go. Oh, it, it's endless. We need all of the cybersecurity experts we can get. Okay. Thank you. Again, thank you for the presentation, Wynn. And um, no, my pleasure. And there's there's what we just heard. And coming up for our next presentation, for. There is uh, September 9th, we have our V Chapter Awards celebration to recognize all our nominees and name our winners. Um, so it's time to do that. Recognize your uh, staff and outstanding star performers. And that can be done at the thinkhdi.com site. And under membership, there's an awards um, item to click. And then you may select the award name. There is um, Service Desk Analyst of the Year, Desktop Support Analyst of the Year. And, uh, you know, fill out the nomination. And the deadline for that is October 31st. Uh, we're almost halfway there. So make sure you get that in. We will be doing the judging in November. And then on December, as we stated, will be the celebration to recognize all our nominees. Um, the winners from that V-Chapter celebration have a chance to compete in a regional competition. And um, if they uh, pass the regional uh, competition, as one of our nominees did last year, they go to Las Vegas in 2015 to compete it at the HDI conference on a national level. Again, we're also planning for next, although this is our last webcast of this year, we are planning one in February of next year. 
And we will announce details of that as we get closer to it. And uh, we, we covered questions. Um, I don't see any more questions out there. So we covered that. And again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and participating. There's a lot of good discussion. And feel free to step into the lounge and continue that discussion. And again, thank you all for coming very much. And thank you, Wynn, and thank you to our sponsors, Log Me In. And thank you, Roy. And that concludes our presentation for today.